Worries, wealth, and the general noise of this world can be very distracting, so that beyond all argument, it is easier to sit on the sidelines than it is to engage in the struggle which constitutes the Christian life well lived to the glory and good pleasure of Jesus Christ. Easier, that is, for the sin, nature inherent in us all. But given all the negatives of doing things the wrong way, it is also absolutely the case that doing things the right way is the only path to true happiness, both in the short run of this temporary life and in the eternal one to come. To give in to the weeds or to fight to keep them chopped back instead is the challenge faced by every Christian in this world, or at least it should be for those few Laodiceans who have even deigned to take it up in the first place. Easy listening. Christianity, that is, attending a church where there is no teaching and assuming that this suffices in carrying out one's responsibility to the Lord, is sadly the default setting for the vast majority of believers who are even nominally engaged. The main problem with being lukewarm in that way, an approach which our Lord despises, Revelation 3.15 and 16, is that it makes a Christian vulnerable to spiritual regression. Once momentum is lost, the devil has less trouble deflecting us from the right path and even tempting us to head backwards. There is opposition to be overcome on the right road which leads upward, Proverbs 15.24. Without positive momentum on our climb and under pressure which is not properly handled, backsliding is all but inevitable. The more one resists the spirit and rejects the truth, the less open to the Lord that person's heart becomes. This is called in Scripture the hardening of the heart. 8. Blessed is the man who always fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. Proverbs 28, 14. They knew about God, but they neither honored him as God nor thanked him. Instead, they gave themselves over to the vanity of this world in their speculations, and their senseless hearts were filled with darkness. Romans 1, 21. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do with their minds emptied of the truth. They are darkened in their thinking, separated from the life of God because of this willful ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts against the truth, who, when once they have lost all sensitivity for what is right, have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. This is not how you learn to follow Christ. Ephesians 4:17 through 20 Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as they did at the provocation at Meribah. Hebrews 3, 8 Our Lord gives us in the parable of the sower the four major life courses for the entire human race. We can choose to be one, those who reject the truth, the seed which falls on the hard-packed ground and never germinates the outcome of unbelief and subsequent condemnation. 2. Those who believe initially, but then fall away, the seed which falls in shallow soil then withers from the heat of testing, the outcome of apostasy and subsequent condemnation. 3. Those who believe, but then fail to respond to the mandates of the Christian life of growth, progress and production, the seed which falls among the thorns, so that while it doesn't die, it produces no crop. The outcome of lukewarmness and all the sin unto death depending upon how negative individual choices and behavior happen to be, or what our Lord desires from each and every one of us, for those who believe and respond to our Lord in doing what He wants us to do, the seed which produces thirty, sixty, or a one hundred fold, the outcome of eternal reward commensurate with our effort in this life. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. Hebrews 6, 9 As with any group of genuine believer, it is fair to assume that while there may be an overall trend, representatives of all three later types, and occasionally even some unbelievers of type number one, may be present in the fellowship. Judging from Paul's approach throughout this epistle and from the citation above, it seems clear that in his estimate the trend was towards category number three, the majority of those to whom he wrote being stuck in the weeds and thorns or headed in that direction. 
He was also very worried that once headed backward, it was only a short step from Category 3, lukewarm and or licentious, to Category 2, loss of salvation in apostasy, or at least the sin unto death for those who did not slip quite that far. No doubt there were also some believers in Jerusalem in the good fourth category, and Paul was counting on them accepting this letter and its content, then distributing it, and using it warn and encourage the others as a major means of reversing the dangerous trends the epistle addresses. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took, though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants, and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Matthew 13.31 and 32 He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Mark 4.26-29 just as spiritual growth is a process that doesn't happen overnight, but occurs imperceptibly over time, so also believers do not generally regress from a peak of spiritual maturity instantly, so that the very fact of their trend of distancing themselves from the Lord may be hard to notice on a day-by-day -day basis, by others or by themselves. But it does happen, and just as going uphill is harder than going downhill, it is easier to regress in the spiritual life than it is to progress. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Matthew 7.13 We have much to say about this subject of Christ's spiritual death and priesthood, but it is difficult to communicate such advanced things to you because your ears have become lazy. And although by this time you ought to be capable of teaching such things, instead you need someone to teach you what the basic principles of God's truth are all over again. You have turned back into spiritual infants who need milk and cannot yet tolerate solid food. Hebrews 5.11-14 through 14. Many of the Jerusalem believers who had relapsed spiritually may not have fully realized it, their consciences having become weakened through the process of hardening. But by returning to the law, falsely interpreted and administered by unbelievers, they had made it very clear to anyone observing them that they had indeed backslid and dangerously so. One of the great values of studying the book of Hebrews is something which much scripture shares. We who read and listen and study in the Spirit are encouraged by the courageous faith of believers who do what is right and by considering those who behave in the opposite way, we are warned of the consequences of heading in the wrong direction and reverting to loving the world instead of loving the Lord. There is much of both in Hebrews. The great advantage of considering the second category of believer is that we can feel with godly fear the horror of slipping away from the Lord without actually doing so ourselves and without suffering any of the consequent divine discipline. That is blessed and spiritually salutary as well. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. 1 Corinthians 10.11 See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Hebrews 12.25 just as in linguistic analysis, much can be understood about the positive qualities of a word by studying its negated version and its usage, that is, unfriendly tells us a lot about what the word friendly means, so the negative example of the spiritual situation of the Jerusalem believers described in the book of Hebrews informs us greatly about what the positive and polar opposite would be. Studying the wrong way and its consequences also informs our understanding of the right way and its blessed results, and should, therefore, motivate us greatly to do what is right in the eyes of our Lord and eschew what is wrong, choosing spiritual growth, 
progress and production for him over compromising with the world for ephemeral security or pleasure, as many of Paul's intended audience were doing. 